So we're recording the meeting as usual. And um, yeah, these classes, for those who haven't been before, are ongoing. And we're using the wonderful um, anthology of the Buddhist teachings on social and communal harmony by the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, compiled by him, but in the words of the Buddha, like he's basically taking excerpts out from the Pali Canon on various themes. And so, as I said, this uh, particular theme is on dealing with anger. And we are sometimes only doing a small paragraph and then having a lot of discussion together around it and around how it relates to our life, um, how we can make use of these teachings to bring more peace and harmony and understanding to our lives and our actions. So, and in particular, anger, of course, is one of those um, very obviously afflictive and harmful emotions that we're all subject to from time to time. And there's a whole spectrum of emotions that can come under that label, if you like, of anger, you know, things we might not always realize are necessarily anger, such as irritation, frustration, impatience, maybe boredom, depression, restlessness could even be a kind of irritation, you know, unsatisfaction, dissatisfaction with the moment. You know, there's something about the moment that's not good enough, and then we become averse to it. We sort of reject it. We push away. Hello, Ling. Most welcome. Hi. <laughs> nice to have everyone here. So it's a really interesting um, oh, afflictive emotion, let's say. I don't like the word defilement, but... Um, you know, Ajahn Brahmali, one of my teachers, reckons that it's one of the easiest to overcome because we can do a lot of reflection around it and possibly also because it's so obviously unpleasant, whereas greed, wanting, craving, it has a certain addictive quality. Anger too, but the greed, the wanting is something we generally see as pleasant. And this is where, you know, the, the difficulty lies never being satisfied with where we are and always wanting something more it's the root cause one of the root causes of suffering right it's the direct cause if you like <clears throat> so as i said we've done a few uh, chapters already a few classes already on uh, the anger theme and today we're on page 54 if you have the book don't worry if you don't um either you can get the book if you want to come back to these uh, sort of classes or you can just listen because I'll be reading it out anyway and what we'll do um, throughout the reading is have opportunity for some discussion some questions or some input from you around how it speaks or doesn't speak to you how it applies or um, maybe informs you or gives you ideas to work with in your life so you can raise your virtual hand by finding the little icon at the bottom of the screen that says raise hand and you will be unmuted. Is Rennie doing that today or yeah? So Rennie will uh, call your name out to let you know that you now can speak and uh, I'll pause every so often. But if anything comes up in the meantime, please raise your hand and we'll come to you when it's convenient. OK, so shall we begin? Uh, <clears throat> and often I'm changing the language slightly because it's usually addressed to the monks. So sometimes I say monastics, sometimes I say community, but really it includes all of us because the Buddha's teachings are universal. So this particular passage is from the Anguttara Sevens, number 64, and it's called The Seven Dangers. So the Buddha says, community. There are these seven things that are gratifying and advantageous to an enemy that come upon an angry man or woman. What seven? Here, an enemy wishes for an enemy. May they be ugly. For what reason? An enemy does not delight in the beauty of an enemy. When an angry person is overcome and oppressed by anger, though they may be well bathed, well anointed, with trimmed hair and beard, or maybe hair and no beard, dressed in white clothes, they are still ugly. This is the first thing gratifying and advantageous to an enemy that comes upon an angry man or woman. So somebody who we don't like, we see them looking ugly um, and we feel quite happy about that, right? 
So in other words, we want those who we feel averse towards to suffer, not to have any advantages, not to be liked by others. And if they are beautiful, we, we don't like that very much. So there's this stinginess that to me sort of speaks of a certain stinginess and a, a sort of small mindedness, not wishing well for another. It's really the opposite of metta and loving kindness, isn't it? You know, may all beings be happy and well. May they not suffer. May they be pleasing. But here we want them to actually suffer. We don't want them to enjoy life very much. So I'll keep reading, giving other examples. Again, an enemy wishes for an enemy. May they sleep badly. <laughs> for what reason? An enemy does not delight when an enemy sleeps well. When an angry person is overcome and oppressed by anger, though they may sleep on a couch spread with rugs, blankets and covers, with an excellent covering of antelope hide, with a canopy and red bolsters at both ends, still one sleeps badly. This is the second thing gratifying and advantageous to an enemy that comes upon an angry man or woman. Hmm. So not only do we wish that they sleep badly here, but they actually do sleep badly. So the Buddha's in a sense talking about the natural outcome of having anger that one is not able to sleep. But if they do sleep well, we don't like that very much. I can already relate to that, you know, slightly. Not that I wouldn't want people to sleep well, but I know for myself, like if, say, there's a person who is, I don't know, an oppressor of many or, um, you know, a, a tyrant, um, somebody who's involved in, you know, great harm. You know, we can think about governments that are oppressive and that, slaughter their own people. Are we happy to hear that they sleep well at night? Do we want them to sleep well at night? Do we rejoice or do we actually think they shouldn't be sleeping well at night? So it's a little bit different from wishing that they don't, but I can see where this is pointing somehow. Somehow we like to feel there's a natural order in the world and that people get their just desserts, so to speak. But is that really helpful? Is that really helpful to us? Are we not just taking on some of those negative qualities that we see in the enemy and bringing ourselves, you know, a little bit down to their level by wishing them harm? Because in my experience, people only really cause harm to others if they're suffering themselves and they might not realize they are. You know, their good karma might continue for a while so that they don't seem to be affected. They still seem to have a happy life. But for sure, you can know that planting those seeds of hate is going to um, lead to their destruction in the long run, right? It's going to lead to unhappy states of mind, unhappy states of being in the long run. Um, I'll keep reading because I do want to get through uh, this sort of at least, and we'll have questions maybe and some discussion at the end. So the third one, is another thing we might wish. So again, an enemy wishes for an enemy. May they not succeed? For what reason? An enemy does not delight in the success of an enemy. When an angry person is overcome and oppressed by anger, if they get what is harmful, they think I've gotten what is beneficial. And if they get what's beneficial, they think I've gotten what is harmful. When overcome by anger, they get these things which are diametrically opposed. They lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. This is the third thing gratifying and advantageous to an enemy that comes upon an angry man or woman. And again, an enemy wishes for an enemy. May he not be wealthy or may she not be wealthy or may they not be wealthy. For what reason? An enemy does not delight in the wealth of an enemy. When an angry person is overcome and oppressed by anger, kings appropriate for the royal treasury any wealth that they have acquired by energetic striving, amassed by the strength of his arms or her arms, earned by the sweat of their brow, righteous wealth righteously gained. This is the fourth thing gratifying and advantageous to an enemy that comes upon an angry man or woman. Again, an enemy wishes for an enemy. May they not be famous. 
for what reason an enemy does not delight in the fame of an enemy. When an angry person is overcome and oppressed by anger, they lose whatever fame they have acquired through heedfulness. This is the fifth thing gratifying and advantageous to an enemy that comes upon an angry man or woman. Again, an enemy wishes for an enemy. May they have no friends. <laughs> for what reason? An enemy does not delight in an enemy having friends. When an angry person is overcome and oppressed by anger, their friends and companions, relatives and family members avoid them from afar. This is the sixth thing gratifying and advantageous to an enemy that comes upon an angry man or woman. So we like it when they don't have friends, or at least we don't like, we don't delight in them having friends. And the last one, and again, an enemy wishes for an enemy. With the breakup of the body after death, may they be reborn in the plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the lower world, in hell. For what reason? An enemy does not delight in an enemy's going to a good destination. When an angry person is overcome and oppressed by anger, they engage in misconduct by body, speech, and mind. As a consequence, still overcome by anger, with the breakup of the body after death, they are reborn in the plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the lower world, in hell. This is the seventh thing gratifying and advantageous to an enemy that comes upon an angry man or woman. These are the seven things gratifying and advantageous to an enemy that come upon an angry man or woman. So somebody said in the chat here, isn't it scary to think that if they aren't sleeping well because of causing harm, they will continue the harm. That's true, yeah. Yeah, because by making themselves more like the, the effects of this anger has more detrimental effects on the person and makes it even harder for that person to be in a good state of mind. And certainly I know for myself, if I don't sleep so well, I'm much more likely to be irritable with others and, you know, to be in a bad mood, not to maybe rejoice in my life and the blessings of my life, not to be able to spread quite so much loving kindness, simply because the energy is not there, right? So sure, that anger is a cause for not sleeping well. And then it's like a vicious circle. It's interesting that most of these, um, you know, uh, effects of anger are the precise opposite of loving kindness, right? So one of the qualities of loving kindness is that you do sleep well. So in a sense, you can check yourself. If you're not sleeping well, is that because there's anger? Maybe there's not any obvious anger that's going through your mind in terms of a storyline or any you know overt kind of hate or or maybe you haven't had an argument but perhaps there's an absence of meta perhaps there's a lack of loving kindness of that softness of the heart that gives you the sense of well-being and ease that helps you sleep yeah so Renny's kindly put in the uh the sort of reference there so I'm sure if you read it there'll be a backstory as well to this so are there any questions comments reflections on this that anyone would like to share because I find it quite an interesting sutta you know in the sense that uh it's quite natural for us not to wish that this person doesn't have these advantages and at the same time they tend not to and we're somehow happy and gratified by that is that a good thing? Is that because it's the law of karma and somehow things do work out the way they should? Or is that actually not such a great thing because we're causing ourselves more suffering by having those uh, thoughts, those negative thoughts? Perhaps karma will come around anyway without us harming our own mind in the meantime. Any thoughts or comments? I can see there's some uh, comments in the box. So Ellen's saying, what is meant by enemy? We don't use that expression so much in our everyday life. Yeah, that's true. 
That's true. And it's probably a good thing that you don't, because perhaps you don't actually have anyone in your life that you consider an enemy. I tend to think of it like I would like to know the Pali, actually. I'm not sure what the Pali is in this uh, particular sutta. Um, but I, I tend to think of it as falling in the category of the difficult person. So it might not necessarily be an enemy, like somebody you hate or somebody who's necessarily out to harm you, but it could be somebody who you dislike, somebody who, when you think of them, you can feel your sort of heart start to race or you can feel like <laughs> you're getting quite agitated. I mean, it happens all the time when watching television, for example, right? And you see what's happening in the world or you see some politician talking about, I don't know what, something popped into my mind but I won't that I won't repeat <laughs> and we can kind of feel a sense of irritation and frustration with these people so at that moment the person could be an enemy and I think these categories are not fixed you know it's just pointing out that in life there are people that we do find pleasant and appealing that we approve of and there are people who we don't there are people who in a sense you know the definition is within the sutta there are people who we we don't rejoice in their happiness we don't rejoice in their beauty and their success we don't rejoice in them succeeding um, being wealthy being famous having friends so I think it's those kind of people however you would define that for yourself there may be people that you don't particularly want to be living a happy life or having friends having lots of success right if you think about say um, I mean for myself what's coming to mind a lot is the situation in Myanmar with the um, military regime uh, torturing its own people. Do I want those people to have good friends and sleep well and be successful? I'm not sure. It's not that I wouldn't wish those things, but I doubt that I would delight in them. And that's what this sort of seems to be pointing to, that we do not delight in enemies having friends. We do not delight in enemies going to a good destination. Right. Would you delight if the result of that kind of oppression would lead to the heaven realm for those people? So I'm sure it's subtler than that, but I think it might be pointing to where, to a kind of law of nature in a sense, that it's quite natural not to delight in those things, but perhaps it's also a call for us to question whether there could be a more appropriate and beneficial response toward an enemy, perhaps something to do with compassion, something to do with um, equanimity, you know, understanding that they suffer for their own actions and it doesn't necessarily help if we start to get emotionally involved. I can see that um, Mariana has, has his hand up. Can we come to, to you? Mariana, I'm Hi. happy to Okay, can you hear me? Hi, perfectly. Very good. Yeah, something that occurred to me is uh, there is a special category as well of uh, enemies, in quotes, and it is where they are in my way. Yeah, they, they seem to be thwarting whatever effort, uh, you know, and putting into something or whatever, and that is a very helpful kind of enemy. <laughs> Because they are pointing out uh, where my problem is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very true. That's very true, yeah. Because sometimes these enemies might not be necessarily terrible people. So why are we making them wrong? Why are we making them bad? Why are we unable to relate to them with loving kindness? It could be something in us that's being triggered that we haven't yet really embraced and understood. I don't know about you, Mariano, but sometimes I notice that the things I can't accept in myself are the things I can't accept in others, right? So if I'm reacting to a particular quality of another person, sometimes it's that I'm projecting that onto them. You know, it's something I can't own in myself, therefore I make it the other person's problem. And that means that I don't have to look at it in myself. And perhaps, you know, that person has more of it in my mind, <laughs> you know, but perhaps the sum of that in myself as well. And I haven't fully contacted that and understood the suffering that that causes for me. Because I think when we understand that, you know, it causes a suffering to be, say, stingy or to be 
I don't know, impatient, then when we see another person who's stingy and impatient, rather than becoming angry and sort of saying this is an awful person, we might actually feel, oh, I know that. I know how that feels. I know where they're coming from, you know? And and the compassion has a chance to arise instead. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because the whole of the Buddha's path is to look at oneself. I think it's Ajahn Chah who said, you know, at the most, look at others 5% of the time, look at yourself the rest of the time. And that was at the most. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be 5% of the time, right? <laughs> and this is for people in monasteries, because in monasteries, you know, a lot of projection and rubbing up friction can arise. Yeah, because the world, your world is quite small, so you can be very much affected by those around you and sort of feel it's all in them. So, and our challenge is to kind of sit down with that and look at what, how we're creating suffering for ourselves by the way we kind of chew on the things that have happened. And just going back to the chat to make sure. Yeah, somebody saying, my anger is a mask, hiding my hurt feelings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Isn't it just, yeah. It's amazing to have that awareness. You know, I think this is where the healing can start. It takes a certain amount of um, courage and honesty and humility to notice that. And sometimes, you know, I know in the past I've sort of felt that it's much better if people can just feel their hurt, express their hurt, you know, anything but be angry. But later on, after having some contact with someone who was very angry and did wear a mask, I realized that mask was necessary for a time because it was just too much for her to like actually start to unpack it. And if it comes out too soon, you know, it can be quite dangerous for themselves. It can be overwhelming and also for others, especially if there's some, some uh, trauma involved. So sometimes, you know, that, that mask needs to be there, but I guess it's, um, how ready you are to to look inside and and to look inside in a way that's compassionate and gentle not to sort of rip that mask off and go straight into where it hurts but to go in gently and to go in with a lot of compassion and patience for oneself and to do so when you're feeling safe you know uh, yeah and of course, anger is always very dangerous when we express it by body and speech. So that's where the restraint comes in. But uh, yeah, a lot of that anger is just a sort of uh, a fear also, a fear of being vulnerable, a fear of feeling the pain. Yeah. Uh, that's, I think, where metta can really help as well. Practice of loving kindness can really, really help. And it can be loving kindness towards your own feelings loving kindness towards yourself right but even towards your own anger not loving kindness that's like may i not be angry but loving kindness that's like may i open my heart to this pain may i actually welcome it may i learn to embrace it and understand it and someone's saying that they, they treat themselves more as an enemy than anyone else yeah how many people relate to that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> quite a few, quite a few. That's really true, isn't it? Because, you know, we live with ourselves 24 hours a day. We live with others some of the time, perhaps, but we're always with ourselves. And so if we do have anger inside or, you know, dissatisfaction with our lives, we tend to, you know, we tend to uh, blame ourselves for that, beat ourselves up for that. <laughs> and it's natural to sometimes feel, you know, unsatisfied in life, <laughs> to feel that things are going wrong, to feel that maybe we have failed in some way. But uh, it's so strange because we do take things very personally. Um, whereas if we're talking to a friend who says, oh, this happened today and I felt terrible about it, I've done the wrong thing, we'd probably say it wasn't you, it wasn't your fault, it was the conditions, you know, you just didn't have enough support or 
you know, you took, it was too, the situation was very difficult. Anybody would have behaved that way in that situation. You know, you're doing actually really well. Look at your good qualities. You know, as a friend, we say that to another person, right? But how often do we actually say that to ourselves? With ourselves, it's like, come on, you should have known better. You know, you can do better than that. Uh, oh, you're a failure just because you had to cancel one retreat. It's like, never mind all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other talks that you've given. It's like, no, you couldn't do this. Ah, oh, it's all going wrong, you know. And yeah, we do. We have extremely high expectations and standards for ourselves. Um, but again, it's seeing that, isn't it? Not believing in it, seeing it and recognizing that something's out of whack. And from there, we can perhaps start to soften our judgment of ourselves. Yeah, the anger that is described here is related to people. Do I understand correctly that others are always a source of anger? Um, I think this sort of is speaking more about our relationship to other people. Um, and I'm sure that if we are still, you know, worldlings who haven't overcome anger and <laughs> taken it out by the root, then we are going to project that onto others. Definitely, we are going to project that into the world because we haven't yet learned to handle it and understand it within ourselves. So in that sense, you could say they're a source, but I wouldn't say they're the root source. I'd say they're more the sort of object of our anger than the actual cause. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible to be liberated. It wouldn't be possible to be enlightened because people are always going to behave in ways that are disagreeable and even harmful. Um, but there are people in this world that you know, are free from anger that are actually fully free from anger. And uh, it may be quite hard to meet such people, but they do exist. I mean, I've definitely been around people that I have never seen a trace of anger in. And that is, and not many, I mean, I say people, maybe person or persons maybe. Um, and you have to be around them a long time to notice that, but it is possible to overcome. I think really by understanding that the anger is hurting us, before it can ever hurt anyone else. So the real source of anger and craving is delusion. That's the ultimate source of it. It's uh, not understanding things properly, taking things to be self when they're non-self, taking things to be permanent when they're impermanent, taking things to be happiness when they're actually suffering. So it's misunderstanding these characteristics of life. We don't yet fully understand that really nothing has an intrinsic essence. Everything is a product of causes and conditions. So there really isn't a person to be angry with. But of course, this is a high level of understanding. I mean, one of my teachers, I think it was Goenkaji, my first teacher, or it might be Ajahn Brahm, I'm not sure. But they both have, you know, the Dhamma is the Dhamma, whoever expresses it. And they're both saying, like, look at a being in terms of the five khandhas, the five components of existence. What are we essentially comprised of? You know, there's, there's the body, material form, there's feeling, yeah? Sensation, if you like, or experience is Ajahn Brahm's translation nowadays. There's perception, there's... Um, volitional action or <laughs> will you could call it sankara and there's consciousness the what else is there in a human being what else is there in any being there are these five components of existence and if we understand that they're all arising and passing and we actually start to see how feeling comes feeling goes you know perceptions come perceptions go they're changing all the time then how can we really be angry with another person it's like which part of that person are you angry with are you angry with their Vedana with their feeling? Are you angry with their perception? Are you angry with their body? Because that part that you're angry with has actually already disappeared, right? So if we break things down in this way, and this is really the practice of Vipassana, then we can see that what we're actually angry with doesn't really exist. It's more like a memory of that person or a memory of the way that person manifested at that particular moment, the things they said at that moment the way we think they were perceiving us at that moment. You know, often I find that anger is when we think people are perceiving us a certain way or perceiving life a certain way. But perception, I mean, I don't know about you, but I can have so many different perceptions of a situation just in a few moments, never mind in a day. You know, one minute a retreat getting cancelled is the 
end of the world and the next moment it could be like an opportunity to see how things go you know to travel and to go with the flow <laughs> we can have such a different perception on life and on other person on other people depending on our state of mind so uh Ah, okay. So Renny suggested that Sapato might be enemy in Pali. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You have a question mark there, so I don't know if you've looked it up or if you're not sure, but thank you for offering that. It could well be one of the words. Is it possible to wish very angrily to someone that he or her might please finally come to the insight that they're wrong? Then the anger is a result of wrong expectations of projections and arrogance. Is it possible to wish very angrily to someone that they might please come to the insight that they're wrong? <laughs> I wonder if you'd like to speak or ask that question, because uh, it's quite interesting. I mean, sometimes maybe we're sure that they're wrong. I'm not sure they always are or whether we just think they are. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's what I ask myself very often when I see that people, please, please, please have more matter. Please, please, please don't be so blind. And I'm getting angry about that. Right. So what is the reason for that? It's my projection. It's my wrong expectations. It's my arrogance. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> is this possible to be angry about a lack of matter? From, from the others and from myself. Okay. It's <laughs> yeah. a little bit disturbed <laughs> in, in, in the feeling. So feeling lots of matter by, ah, feel more love. Ah! <laughs> it can be possible. <laughs> yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. I'm laughing about it, but sometimes I'm really very angry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. I, I just muted you because there's quite a lot of background noise, but please unmute if you want to say more. Um, yeah, it's really interesting because what starts off, I think, in this case, as a, a positive wish, a wholesome wish, like, please have more meta. I wish you could come out of your suffering. <laughs> starts to be more about you because you want them to have more meta and, and whatever for your sake also, right? So, <laughs> um, and then the irritation comes in because they're not the way we want them to be. And yeah, they're falling short of our expectations. It's funny, isn't it, how we have these expectations? I'm not sure why we do. I guess it's more the case also, say, if you've married a person or if, uh, yeah, and, and then they change, <laughs> you know, the expectation you once had is like, no more. And then we don't give people that space to just be the way they are. Yeah, it's uh, an interesting one, but it's good that you can see where it sort of slips from, you know, a positive wish that might be very genuine into something that's harming you and that is no longer very helpful. And of course, it's not going to get a good response from the other. <laughs> I don't know. Is there anything else to say on that one? No. <laughs> yeah. Righteous indignation, huh? That's part of it. A sense of righteous indignation. Oh, that's nice. Janik is offered, anger is a punishment one gives to oneself for another person's mistake. <laughs> uh -huh. And Sybil says, it's really helpful to be kind to the anger. And Pat's saying that sometimes it seems that being friendly and peaceful agitates other people. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. That sometimes if I turn up in a good mood and I'm peaceful and chilled out and I'm around people that are sort of agitated and stressed, it's almost as though my own chilled outness uh, highlights to them their stress and they actually prefer to have someone on the same sort of energy level of stress than someone peaceful around because of that. You know, it sort of highlights just how much stress they're carrying. Yeah. It's interesting because there's another sutta, I don't know if we've gone past it or not, or if it's in this topic, but it's about how people who are like-minded seem to 
um, be drawn together like magnets, you know, people that are sort of in a way on the same energy frequency are drawn to each other because it's more comfortable, isn't it? If we're sort of being validated as how we are and not being confronted with people who maybe do seem much happier because I guess everybody's struggling to be happy. And if you're very peaceful, it might highlight to them that there is something in their life they're not so happy about. And not everybody's ready to face that, you know? So I think it's important not to sort of say, why are you not peaceful? <laughs> and uh, maybe not even to come on too strong sometimes, like sometimes just to keep that happiness and that peace a little bit contained within yourself um, and be able to be receptive to the other person in small doses if possible because sometimes it can also drain you very much if you're around that sort of more negative energy for a long time. Misery loves company, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we need it, you know, it's not that um, it's evil or something to be upset and to wish that another person could be there to soothe you or comfort you. It's uh, sometimes we need to say how we feel in a safe space with someone who cares and, uh, it's difficult because I know for myself, sometimes I need to express things and I don't want to offload onto somebody. But at the same time, if someone's really a good friend, they are genuinely caring about how you feel and they want to help. And it can help to a point. But again, you know, we have to practice self-care if we are, you know, being with a friend who's going through a struggle. It's important to tell them you're, that you're there for them, but also express that Perhaps you need a little break and some time to yourself as well. Yeah. Is it the right attitude to wish the snake well, but not to like them? <laughs> yeah, Ajahn Brown has a phrase, love the tiger from a distance. It's similar. It's similar. Uh, certainly, if you're going to get bitten, it's good to keep a distance. Not liking them. I don't think you really need to like or dislike somebody. I mean, if, if you actively don't like them and that's an aversive quality, then I think we can develop more loving kindness. But you don't, that doesn't mean you have to associate with them. It doesn't mean you have to be their friend and have them in your life and see them for tea. It doesn't mean this. It just means that we take care of our heart to make sure that we're not harboring any kind of resentment or ill will towards another person. Um, but certainly it's important to choose our friends. It's really, really important to associate with people who seem to be on the right path, seem to be trying to practice right speech, right livelihood, right action, etc. And, you know, to be around people that inspire and uplift you rather than pull you down. So certainly those who are on the path trying to develop the qualities that you yourself want to emulate and develop in, your, in you. So, yeah, it is good. Yeah. And you have mentioned Meta there. You're wishing the snake well. Yeah, loving the tiger from a distance. And it might be a huge distance, you know. I mean, if you have been maybe abused by somebody or really harmed by somebody, it might not be helpful even to bring them to mind in the loving kindness meditation, maybe for years, you know. Maybe you don't want to invite them into that. Maybe you first need to resource yourself and practice with the loved person or practice with yourself until you feel really, really ready. And then, you know, you could bring them in like, in a group so it's still at a distance it's not like you with that person it could be that you're surrounded by all your friends and they're just there on the periphery and they just come for a minute and then they leave again you know and you have the control over that or it could be like what happened to me my friend kind of attacked me physically uh, a long time ago about 11 years ago now and um she said oh we should just practice meta we should just practice meta but for me that was way too triggering so I didn't, I just looked after myself. And then one time when I was practicing a lot of metta, um, using my best friend actually as my loved person for about 10 days, at some point this other person came to mind and it was almost like she just hopped into the flow of metta and it, there was no impact in my mind. It was just, I felt so safe, so resourced that this person just came in at the right time. It didn't have a traumatic impact. And from then on, I could think about her without any uh re-arising or triggering of that trauma so I think that was a really powerful experience for me to see that sometimes we don't need to do the healing it just happens in its own time so long as we trust the practice you know we we just trust our own intentions to heal to develop loving kindness and the results come in their own time 
the healing happens in its own time. So there's a lot of questions coming in. Uh, is, are people happy for me to go through these now? Yeah. There's, and then we'll get back onto the, uh, the sutta. So uh, someone's asking, what if the tiger or snake is your relative that you're responsible for? Yeah, then it's difficult. Then I think a lot of loving kindness towards yourself as a kind of protective shield so you can imagine that this tiger and this snake wants to bite you but you know if you have like this force field of loving kindness around you like a white light or a kind of bubble that's filled up with goodness and love then they can't actually hurt you too much um a lot of compassion to yourself i think that's the only thing i can really suggest if you really cannot uh, have time away from them um, if you can, if you can share that responsibility, that's better because then you have time to process things. Uh, if you're always around them, if they're, you know, say in care, then um, I would say try to get some support. But just keep taking time for yourself to breathe and to check in with yourself, to ask yourself how you are and to give yourself some loving kindness, definitely. Anger beyond a momentary instinctual reaction seems to be associated with the tendency to find fault. Definitely, definitely. It's that fault finding mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um, the perception that sort of has this negative bias. Um, in a sense, a lack of gratitude again and a lack of, uh, of mudita, a lack of being able to rejoice for what is good in what is good. Yeah. And it's something that's come over many of us. I think it's cultural as well, but I think at the moment with the COVID and the pandemic and all the difficulties around that, it's very easy to focus on what's wrong because it's so blatant, isn't it? So obvious, but it doesn't take a lot of skill to do that. It's the obvious thing to do. It takes a little bit more training of the mind to look for what we do have going for us, which most of us have a safe space to live. Most of us, have some company or some people in our lives who care um, we have the dhamma teachings freely available accessible you know we have this community space we have food we have shelter there's a lot we can look forward to we also have you know good health care in these countries believe it or not compared to most we have the privilege of free vaccines if we want to take them we even have a choice <laughs> we do have a choice um, there's so much we can be happy about, but we have to intentionally bring it up in our mind to counteract that negative bias that the mind has too for its own survival. Yeah. Wouldn't it be more helpful to wish our enemies good sleep, happiness, good friends, and so on? They can only change through good influence. Yes, exactly. And I think that's really what this sort is pointing to. You know, it's pointing to the fact that anyway, they are having bad sleep naturally because anger leads to that. We don't have to wish that on them. You know, that's the result of their actions. That's the result of their anger. And so if we can wish them those other things, then they're less likely to be angry, but also um, those other things will be a consequence of that anger diminishing. So by wishing them those things, we're actually wishing them freedom from anger and they'll be less likely to be able to cause harm to others. So absolutely, this is, I think, the whole point of the sutta in a way, or one could read it that way. It's pointing towards our tendencies, but our tendencies that are perhaps not so skillful and not very beneficial to us. Um, and we don't need to wish those things. We don't need to wish that a person have no friends. You know, it's not going to change things. It's just going to make our own minds bitter. So certainly it's a practice. And tomorrow, actually, we're having a meta meditation specifically for the difficult person. So every Saturday, not every Saturday, but second Saturdays, I think we have a meta meditation for an hour on Saturday morning, nine till ten. And we go through the different categories of being. So last week we did the neutral person. This week it's the difficult person. So um, we can do these wishes. We can wish our so-called enemies or people we find difficult well-being and happiness and peace. And um, we'll do that gently. We'll do that at a distance, you know, and just as much as you wish. 
by starting with ourselves and the loved. So we start, you know, with the easier people to build up that loving kindness. And then when possible, if possible, we can just practice a little bit with a difficult person. And uh, really we're changing our own heart. It doesn't matter if it has effects or not on anyone else. Even if it doesn't seem to have an effect on you, the very fact that you intend it is already a step in the right direction. So, yeah. Good. So it's uh, we still have almost half an hour. So shall we see if we can get uh, into the next sutta as well? It's only a shortish one. Unfortunately, this one has lots of dots that usually come up when there's repetition. But in here, I don't even know what they're repeating. So I'll try and work it out. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah okay so this one's called being spurned by others and this is from Anguttara Nikaya 3 27 so what kind of person is to be looked upon with equanimity not to be followed and served here, some person is prone to anger and easily exasperated. Even if they are criticized slightly, they lose their temper and become irritated, hostile, and stubborn. They display irritation, hatred, and bitterness. Just as a festering sore, if struck by a stick or a shard, will just discharge even more matter, so too, even if they are slightly criticized, they lose their temper and become irritated, hostile, and stubborn and display irritation, hatred, and bitterness. And then a couple more similes. Just as a firebrand of the Tinduka tree, if struck by a stick or shard, will sizzle and crack even more so, even more, so too. This person who, even if they are slightly criticized, loses their tempo and becomes irritated, hostile, and stubborn, etc. Just as a pit of feces, if struck by a stick or a shard, becomes even more foul smelling, so too some person here is prone to anger and displays irritation, hatred, and bitterness, etc. So <clears throat> that's quite graphic. Such a person is to be looked upon <clears throat> with equanimity, not to be associated with, followed and served. For what reason? With the thought that they might insult me, revile me and do me harm. Therefore, such a person is to be looked upon with equanimity, not to be associated with, followed and served. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? That uh, the advice here seems to be that we protect ourselves from this person. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to be insulted, reviled and harmed. So where the Buddha's using equanimity in this sense is almost like um, not just tolerating that person, but almost ignoring that person leaving them alone. And I think this relates a little bit to another sutta where the Buddha talks about um, five ways of overcoming anger. I think it's something like loving kindness, compassion, um, loving kindness, compassion, equanimity is one of them and also ignoring that person. I forget the other one actually, but there were five. We'll probably come to it at some point, but um, you know, people are like, oh, should we really ignore somebody? Isn't that really harmful? But I think in a case where we are likely to become harmed ourselves, um, it just means not bringing them up in our mind. For example, people on the news, in the media, you don't have to read about all the terrible people and what they've done. Yeah, you can ignore them. Um, it also means, like it says here, not to be associated with followed or served. So it's not that you disregard them forever and ever and you can't practice metta towards them and you can't, maybe that will not change in the future. It might change in the future. But we don't really, it's not good for us to hang around with those people. Because it's only going to actually not create 
only more harm for us, but it seems to me from this simile is that it creates more harm for that person too. Right? If they keep getting irritated and expressing their anger, they become so foul smelling, it says just as a pit of feces is struck by a, a stick or a shard becomes even more foul smelling. So they're prone to anger. It's almost like that anger is just waiting to ooze out and to you know, cause more damage. So it's better to actually take some distance from this person with equanimity. So I don't know if that speaks to anybody or there are any questions or comments around that. It's obviously not always possible to have a lot of distance from a person. So in that case, perhaps, can we mentally distance ourselves? Is that possible? Yeah. So I actually don't know your name, the one who's just called Zoom user, but anyway, <laughs> I can see that's not your name. <laughs> You're welcome to write it in the chat if you wish. You don't have to either. But you're saying that you were hurt by someone and just kept them at a distance, but treated them with kindness at a distance. Yeah, exactly. Ah, good. Yes, it's Bill. Yeah, you did say so in the beginning. Yes. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very skillful way. Uh, that's sort of what I also did with this person. Treated them with kindness, but I think in my case, I, I was just treating it more with equanimity, as in not really bringing them to mind intentionally. It was almost an ignoring, but with the trust that, you know, eventually that hurt would lessen and the heart would be ready um, to bring them back in. And I've brought them back into my heart, but it, I still haven't met them again. And I don't think that that's even necessary. You know, it just so happens that life hasn't brought our paths together anyway and I feel that if it did I could say hello you know I might make sure I was with someone else to give me some moral support but um I'm pretty sure there wouldn't be any anger or there'd only be a well wishing for that person yeah and sometimes you know our paths just have to go different ways so I'm saying I've definitely been that person who's easily irritated and whose anger was willing to lash out at any moment yeah yeah, yeah, it's wonderful, isn't it, to identify ourselves as well, because we can easily read this and think, oh, it's somebody else. <laughs> but aren't we all these people at some point, right? Because we're changing all the time. <laughs> There's definitely times that, you know, you say anything to you, and, oh, <laughs> you know, nothing's going to work, is it? Because we're just in a really lousy mood. <laughs> I'm sure I was uh, pretty difficult as a teenager. You don't, don't have to say very much to me or maybe a lack of saying something to me and I'd storm off to my room, you know, because my mom didn't ask how I am. So that was it, storm to my room, bang the door. <laughs> and I know that she didn't quite know how to handle that. You know, she's like, I'm walking on eggshells. <laughs> have you ever had that, walking on eggshells around somebody? <laughs> or noticing how someone's walking on eggshells around you? Yeah. Yeah. So we have to be really careful when we criticize others. Some people just can't take it at that moment anyway. And that's, you know, the Buddha's compassionate about that. He doesn't say we should criticize people and that people should take the criticism. He actually gives a very clear indication of when it's appropriate to offer feedback. And the first criteria is actually to, uh, make sure it's a good time for the other person so that person isn't irritated or overwhelmed or suffering with grief or extremely tired so we don't just offer feedback because that could be really triggering and that could be just like the last straw for somebody you never know this angry person they could have been you know maybe it's not their fault right maybe they're a festering sore because they've been at work and just been criticized all day long and then if you come in contact with them after that and say something else, like, why haven't you washed the dishes or I don't know, made dinner, then it could be the last straw. So, you know, this equanimity, this kind of giving them some distance is not necessarily um, an aversive thing to do. It could be a very compassionate thing to do, right? I mean, if you're in a bad mood, sometimes you might wish that people would give you some space, isn't it? 
because you don't want to lash out you don't want to you know become even more angry but you know that you're not in the right state of mind to meet people at that moment mm. yeah so uh so just check in the comments. There's a lot of comments in the box today. You are welcome to put your hands up. I kind of prefer that to have a bit of a discussion. I mean, if you don't feel confident, that's fine. But if you can, please do put your hand up. We will get to you. It's also less work for me because I don't have to read all the comments <laughs> and respond to them without having that like empathy that I get from body language and hearing your voice. Um, I can see Mariano's got their hand up. I'll just um, check that there's no one who hasn't spoken yet in the little box and now I'll come to you. Is there anyone from the box who would like to speak who hasn't spoken yet? So we've got a few more hands coming up. Uh, can we go for Mandy first? Okay, sure, sure. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, Sometimes I think maybe uh, some situations may re require, at least in lay life, for us to show, I don't know if it's anger or passion, but um, I'm trying to just be kind of broad with my description, but um, to be able to show the depths of our experience or what we might have gone through. But I know that in that situation, it's, it's damaging to me. Mm. Um, I, don't, I guess I don't really have a question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. Please take your time to express what you. It's fine. You can work it out as you speak. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Do you want to continue? You're very welcome. Please don't feel shy. I'll give you Is the chance. Is there a time when it you should use anger to express? what um your experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's still it's still damaging then still i see yeah i think i get where you're coming from yeah <clears throat> it sounds to me that there's um in that question you might have a certain situation in mind but i think it's a situation a lot of us can probably relate to where there's that conflict between you know wanting to be true in a sense to the way you feel and yet being concerned that you might cause harm to somebody else by expressing that and you know there's part of it that's wholesome and there's part of it that you know is maybe not that skillful and I think it might be just a matter of timing <clears throat> you know like as the Buddha was saying that there's a skillful time to give feedback there might also that could include a skillful time to express how you really feel to somebody so that you know, there's a time that you don't have to um, actually <clears throat> kind of edit or, um, you know, change what you feel. You can express it clearly, but at a time when there's, when it's less, when the emotion is not at its peak, you know, when there's not an escalation, when it's not likely to escalate, like you've already perhaps processed some of your feelings around it privately on your own and you've come to a place where yes you still feel those things but at that moment you have loving kindness in your heart you have a sense of compassion a sense of a good measure on the situation what would be appropriate what would be too much and you check with that person is this a good time to talk I have something to talk about that might be difficult for you are you in the right state of mind you know I want to try my best to be gentle and kind you can actually say that and I'm worried that you know it might come across as angry because I do feel quite strongly about this, but you know, I'm trying to be constructive. <laughs> so you can actually try to address it that way. Um, go in there with a lot of self-compassion, maybe take a pause, 
every now and then because a part of expressing yourself uh, with kindness is also to do it gently. Gentleness is another aspect. So to monitor, for example, the tone of your voice, if you're getting, if you feel your emotions are rising and it's leading into anger and it's not landing very well, just take a pause, take a step back. Um, so it's subtle and it's difficult. And I really think it's about the timing more than anything else. And going in with, you know, you can't go in without any anger and irritation around something that's emotive, but you can try to make sure that the intention is mostly one of compassion, imbalance, you know, and that compassion is not only to the other, it's towards your own emotions. I hope that makes sense. It's not easy and it's something I think we all kind of, you know, struggle with and have to practice to get right and we'll probably make many, many mistakes, you know, this is how relationships this is why they're so difficult isn't it um so going with the right intentions and the right motivation but perhaps accept that you might make mistakes it might not land the way you wished it to but you can always go back and ask forgiveness mm -hmm. yeah okay let's uh go on Renny. you decide uh, let's admit mariano Hi, you can hear Hi. me, yeah? Yes. Uh, yeah, interesting. One, one thing that comes up often in uh, connection with mindfulness, yeah, I, I heard it uh, from uh, a Christian minister who was teaching mindfulness and uh, she was almost upset with me saying, but when uh, there is anger, mindfulness is no use whatsoever. And I, <laughs> and I hear it, uh, with school children and their teachers as well. And obviously it is, it is a type of mindfulness where I, I am already identified. Yeah, it is me Yeah. Based. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what I do find useful is uh, embodied awareness, the environment, yeah. quality of light, smells in the room, come back to the body. Breathe yeah. deeply, relax, let go of the thoughts. Don't believe your thoughts. You know, wait uh, a day or two and then revisit it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Write uh, that email, but don't send it. Uh, wait <laughs> for the weekend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Super. Yeah, I have a lot of draft emails in my in my uh, drafts. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, very good points and a lot of wisdom there. I, I would agree, actually, Mariano, that um, you can't really be mindful of anger because by the time it has arisen, as you say, you're already, the reason it's arisen is because of a lapse of mindfulness and an over-identification, you know, with that emotion. But we can, it's a different kind of mindfulness that's then aware that anger's arising and it can put the brakes on. I mean, it's kind of hard to stop at that time, but it can put the brakes on. And yeah, especially by connecting to it in our bodies. For me, that's the most helpful way to um, directly take responsibility in a way and experience the anger rather than um, let it ooze out. It's by, you know, catching those, sensations associated with the anger those impulses in the body and feeling them you know feeling the sort of heat or the pulsation or the anxiety sometimes yeah or like a feeling of like for me I don't really get like anger anger like full-on anger it's more like a darkness sort of descends you know it's like a negative kind of ooh. and just getting embodied in that feeling that in the body and allowing that impulse to dissipate a little bit before, you know, allowing it to come out through body or speech is really, really helpful. Yeah, interesting also that you mentioned the other sense doors. I think space outside, get into nature, get a perspective, go to the top of a hill, you know, feel the wind on your face, just be in nature. That can also help it feel as though it's, yeah, your sense of self is less contracted. Yeah, it has more space. Yeah. I will ask Pat to unmute herself. Okay, and then I'll go to the box. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Pat. 
um, yeah, I well, based on my experience, like I was a pretty much a difficult character most of my life, and most of people I met were difficult. So I've concluded it's best to like um, seclude myself from everybody, <laughs> become a bit of a hermit, and um, yeah, and I feel like my behavior has change for better I like myself better but now I love my own company the most oh. so it's kind of weird because now it becomes so, becomes socially awkward <laughs> now that I'm most compatible to hang around with <laughs> I hang around with anybody. <laughs> so it's like uh, I mean I love this sort of setting because I, I know it's peaceful and it's conducive to well-being but generally society it's a bit like, overwhelming and yeah and being like alone or just having, yeah, just being in my own head a lot is pretty useful. I don't know. It's just a statement. Really. Yeah, it's fantastic. Oh, I like that. I, like, I relate to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's also, you know, it's interesting how you start off by saying you're a difficult person. I wonder who tells us these things. You know, I wonder who gives us those messages, really. Why, why do we believe that? Because actually, you could also see it that when you're with yourself, you find out actually you're not. Actually, you like yourself because you're away from those labels, isn't it? And you can actually relate to yourself with compassion and kindness. You maybe were never a difficult person. Who knows? <laughs> to who? <laughs> to who? When? At what point? You know. <laughs> but yeah, it's. Um, that's why we have monasteries really communities of hermits yeah. so we're all together but alone <laughs> and we can always disappear to our kuti that's the ideal monastery Amazing. which i have yeah you can disappear when you've had you know enough input you've been triggered enough or you've triggered others enough then you go and have some time in your heart on your own I just have one question that just appeared do you think sure. it's like an introverted quality or yeah, it could be, could be. I mean, I think a lot of people are introverted. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I would imagine that most people in monasteries are probably introverts. Except Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> no, no, he's an introvert. He's Is a, he? He's oh, yeah, Brahm. yeah, 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 yeah. I once told him he's an extrovert, but it's really not. And I didn't actually mean it in that way. I just meant more how he connects with people, that like he's very, he can connect with people, but that is not the same as being an extrovert. I mean, I'm also, I thought an extrovert, but everyone tells me no, no, because I've only ever had a few close friends and I always prefer a lot of time alone. And I actually, it's completely out of my um, comfort zone to even be in the role I'm in completely. I get recharged through time alone. Mm. Whereas extroverts tend to get charged, recharged by time with others. Yeah. I get drained by time with others. So that okay. sort of suggests that yeah I'm more of an introvert and Ajahn Brahm he always used to spend loads of time alone as a young person loads of time wow uh, he'd always go away wherever he could and when you hang out with him I mean yeah we get on nicely so we do laugh and, and chat a lot but a lot of the time he just wants to sit in the car quietly you know and it's like it's just very lovely to be around it's amazing that. mix wow yeah it's a great mix it's the flexibility I think that comes with a high stage of spiritual development as well that you can mold to the situation but if he has a choice he'll spend time alone so you know he had his sabbatical in 2002 and most monastics they want to go traveling he just stayed in his cave closed the doors and didn't see a single person for six months so that's that's his inclination yeah the teaching is just through the power of the Brahma Viharas. You know, the only reason he teaches, it's not because he wants to teach, it's just there's nothing for him much left to do but teach. So he just <laughs> it's just the Brahma Viharas, you know, it's just Metta, Karuna, Medita, and Upeka, just, yeah. But he does that by resourcing himself in, with a lot of silence every day. So he only meets the lay people once a day for like an hour a day, that's it. So... But I yeah. <laughs> it's nice yeah <laughs> so let me come to the box just because I don't want to I want to answer anything that's actually a question before we end so for Simon and Frank especially have I understood it correctly that we should protect very angry people from our happiness keeping distance not only for our sake but also for theirs oh that's an interesting one 
Oh, I wouldn't necessarily say so. I mean, I think a lot of the time happiness can have a good effect on um, people who are angry, especially if we've actually been kind to them and being kind of patient with them in the beginning. I've noticed when people are angry, for example, when I came here, where I'm currently living, um, we parked the car just up the road outside somebody's house and the person came running up from the house, very angry. You can't park there. (laughs) Like really gesturing very loudly to, to go. And I decided to get out of the car and walk straight up to this person because it was an old man and he looked very sort of vulnerable somehow. And I thought he just doesn't understand, you know, that we're not meaning any harm. So I walked straight up to him and he carried on shouting. And I just said, oh, you know, it's okay. uh, If you want, we'll go. It's not a problem. It's just we're just parking here for an hour, only for an hour. How long? When are you going? Just an hour, if that's okay, you know um we're only here for a while I'm going to and I just explained exactly what I was doing I'm going to the next house and it's just that there's nowhere to park at the next house then he said I can't hear you and then I realized he was deaf so I was like I'm just going to the next house and I'm like can you hear me and then he started to realize that actually we were really taking care of him we were like taking his concerns seriously we were trying to listen to what he was saying trying to give it and also trying to explain to put him at ease. And then he was like, okay, okay, okay. And then he sort of walked back in and I had the feeling that he probably felt a little bit bad about that. And also I just realized how lonely he probably was and how much fear there is around at this time anyway, right? With the coronavirus and everything. So I felt that it really de-escalated very quickly. Once I actually like looked him in the eye, talked to him, tried to hear him and, just connect and I realize it might be the first time he's actually connected with somebody for a very long time so I think sometimes yeah if you're just blatantly sort of throwing your happiness in somebody's face who's angry then no it's probably not a very good thing there needs to be some sort of connection but then bit by bit if you can connect with them and you can resonate with their suffering let them be how they are you know accept them for how they are then bit by bit you can rub off on them actually in a good way um but yeah obviously if you find that somebody just can't handle it and they're throwing their unhappiness on you then it might be wise to take a step back certainly and I would say generally in life like the most the people you want to surround yourself with are the people that are going to nourish you and that are going to help you increase the wholesome qualities help you feel safe help you feel that you can practice you know that you're not always on edge around them So I think in this way, you know, when you're choosing your friends, then yeah, it's good to try to choose people who are cultivating the wholesome. They're not perfect and they're going to have sides of them that may be very irritating from time to time, you know, real obvious flaws. But on the whole, you see that they are well-intentioned people who are trying their best. Yeah. So I hope that makes some sense. And uh, someone else is just flagging that um, their father is very easily angry because of her way she's now conditioned. So I'm not sure if that's because you're the way you are that he's angry or whether you are angry because he's angry. It could be both. We're certainly conditioned by our upbringing very strongly. Yeah. So it is the end. There is one more question, I guess. I can read it so as not to leave anyone out. I feel that anger is a short-lived emotion and less harmful than irritation that is lingering on all the time. E.g. I'm irritated with my neighbours that they make noise despite pleading with them to be more considerate. Yeah. Then it becomes more like, a, yeah, you could call that irritation. I, I, you could also call that a sort of resentment, a sort of um, something that's not shifting. Yeah, that's just being getting stuck uh it's probably less strong so i don't know if it's it's probably not as harmful to them but it could be harmful to you if that's staying with you all the time certainly it's really difficult i mean sometimes people just have to move house two of my friends here actually had to do that because they were um in an apartment where someone was playing extremely loud music right above their head um and it wasn't possible to to change it so uh, if you've done everything you can to try and protect yourself from that noise with, I don't know, earplugs and all, and maybe been to speak to them, maybe you could drop them a little card with a few words, I don't know, and just try to explain in a really non-violent way how it affects you and how you really don't want to, you know, impinge on their lifestyle and yet 
could there be some way of compromise? I don't know. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? It's really hard. Yeah. All the best with it. Just practice meditation for yourself. Don't beat yourself up for being irritated. That's the most important. Don't be like, oh God, now I'm irritated. This is terrible. Just uh, have some compassion for yourself because that's really hard. Yeah, and very draining. Uh, you're not alone with that. Kedwin has the same issue. <laughs> Okay, so we've reached our time, and uh, I'm not sure who wants to say a few words to close. Um, <laughs> Hi, Kelly. Thank you very much, Chanda. Um, yes, I would like to say a few words about Dana. So, as always, this evening's Sutta discussion is offered on a donation basis. And if you would like to offer Dana your gift, whatever you are able to give, uh, would be very much appreciated. It will continue to provide for Venerable Chandler's material needs um, and help her continue to spread the Dharma, set up the first Bikuni monastery in the UK. I've put the link to the Anacampa website uh, with more information about the project and how to donate in the chat box. Um, I think it's disappeared a little bit, but I'll put it in again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kelly. I just remembered, actually, that I wanted to offer the link to our new Tuesday group. I don't know if Matthias has it or could quickly find it. Um, since Ajahn Brahm's retreat, on which we had a silent meditation sitting every day, Matthias has very kindly offered to continue that um, as a donation. Here we go. So because I'm not writing a newsletter yet, um, the link is not in the public forum so please don't keep don't share it anywhere because these groups have to be um secure like zoom has these zoom bombers that come in and so we don't share these links but it's just been put in the chat box basically what we do could you put the time and the day um what we do is meet at seven and the session starts at 7 15 and it's just a silent sitting so it seems like oh that's a bit weird get together on zoom and just sit silently don't even talk but what it does i think is give you all an opportunity to um to have a regular meditation practice you at least have one session in the week that you is guaranteed you're going to make it right and you can sit with others at that time so and there's a certain energy to sitting in a group that you don't get when you're alone because mostly people have their videos on which is lovely so you see everyone sitting quietly and you know many of these faces you've been on retreats and in sessions with them before and it's quite touching how we all just come together for that time and just silently spend time sitting so Matthias opens the room as he says at 7 15 and if you're late then you won't get in because he's meditating too. So that's why please come early. And at eight o'clock he rings a bell and that's it. And there's no talking, no nothing. So you don't have to be ready to say anything clever or wise or let anyone know your name or anything. It's just like a space for you that's held by the group. So please come because it's also very supportive for everyone else. And you might find it's quite supportive for your practice. So that's on a Tuesday. <laughs> It's on a Tuesday. I wonder if we can have all the information in one place. Yeah, there we go. Tuesday sitting group, seven to eight. Okay, so you could just copy that, copy paste the bit that Rennie's put in. And uh, I don't think I can join this week because I've got another teaching session, but you can. So that's wonderful. And that'll be ongoing. Uh, from my side, we've got a meta meditation tomorrow for an hour nine till 10 and Sunday evening, I think there's supposed to be a Dhamma talk. So I'll see if I'm up to that. Otherwise we'll have a Q and A, <laughs> but it'll be a guided meditation anyway. <clears throat> and then, yeah, I'll probably give a little reflection then guided meditation and then some question time on Sunday evening. Okay, so goodbye to everyone. Let's unmute you all and we can wave goodbye. And thank you for those who came for the first time.